Remember what it was like shopping in computer and video game stores in the 80s or early 90s? It was quite something, in no way comparable to what it is now. It was like a fishing expedition, where chance played a large part. It was an experience like nothing else. Back then, there was no online shopping, no online press, no mobile phones, and obviously no YouTube. Information sources for video games were scarce. You had to rely on printed press to know what was going on in the computer world. And as a rule, game magazines were monthly releases. So news wasn't always fresh. If you hadn't been in your favorite computer store for a while, there was a chance you came across something new and unforeseen. You could always be surprised and there was this thrill of some unexpected electronic treasure looking at you from the corner of a shelf. I remember that thrill very well. It began as you entered the shopping mall, even before you reached the computer store. What would you see there? Will there be that game you were waiting for since long ago? Or will there be some other cool one that you didn't even expect to find? You would never know. As a kid back then, you heavily depended on your local reseller. If you weren't among the lucky few to be located near a specialized computer store, you had to rely on big retail stores like Toys R Us, KB Toys, Kmart, Walmart, Best Buy, and so on. It all depended on which one was the nearest, as it was very rare you could take the trip to some other store to look for new games. I don't remember thinking about asking my parents to drive me to somewhere specific to buy games, and I wouldn't know where to go anyway. And if we'd go there by chance, it would always be at a time when I didn't have any pocket money. In the 1980s, my only game providers consisted of a couple of general stores nearby that were selling computer stuff in a corner. Among all their other items, Mario, Zelda, and Kid Icarus seemed lost on a small paradise island between the DIY and the plumbing departments. Sonic was perched on a shelf above light bulbs, along with Strider and Rostin. My early MSX games were so hard to find that I was eager to buy any new one that showed up without even bothering whether it was good or not. There were also some retailers with mail-order catalogs. Sears had a huge one for buying NES games, for instance. The one you see here was released just a few months before Nintendo's console arrived on the market. But as you can see, it has a large choice of titles for the ColecoVision and the Atari consoles. And what you see here are very rare photos of computer shops of that time. How could they know the stuff they were selling could belong to a museum 50 years later? Small shops thought computers and video games were just common goods. The years have proved they have a real cultural value, just like old vinyls and comic books. They had a huge collector potential. Just tell me, who could have guessed in 1985 that a copy of Super Mario, complete with box and all, would have sold 100 times its original price within three decades. Not a bad investment, right? Better than gold. Just look at those big boxes. They were so intriguing, so different from one another. Each corner was dedicated to a different machine, and there were so many of them. Each publisher had its own box format. Games had a soul of their own. Compare that to what it looks like now. Rows upon rows of the same plastic boxes. Everyone has the same machine. There's no room for surprise. No thrill at all. With shops like that, better to buy everything online. This way at least you can avoid the awful business of walking among these soulless shelves. But let's leave the bleak present and go back 30 years. To the golden past of our childhood and teens. At the beginning of the 1990s, computers and video game departments were already taking considerable space inside stores. They were no longer packed in some obscure corner, but in full light and right there in front of people. And the thrill was very much the same. Okay, video game press had developed, and you had a better idea of what you could expect, but you were still relying on the retailer's ability to add the latest releases to its store so that you never knew what you would actually find when you got there. 
I knew nothing about F-19 Stealth Fighter until one day it flashed at me from the screen of a demo PC in the store I just entered. I think I stayed there almost an hour, without exaggerating. Just look at the demo! It was beyond my understanding such a cool thing could exist. And it goes without saying, my only goal since this moment was to have it. By chance, my dad had just bought our first PC a couple of months earlier. This Amstrad 2286 with one megabyte of RAM and a VGA card, which was outstanding back then. And sure thing, I had this box on my desk several weeks later. It's this very one you see here. I bought it back then, one of the very few I kept since that time. It went along with me as I grew up, moved places, and thought about other things than video games. I threw away many games I bought at the time, but this one is among the rare ones I still have, and that's saying a lot. Another one like this is Ultima 6. I treasured this box as much as the other one, but it was a slightly different buying story. Unlike F-19, I had read a lot about Ultima 6, and I waited for it to hit the shelves. I can't even begin to describe what incredible joy I experienced to find it standing there one day. And what a gorgeous box, too! Just look at that! I liked it so much that I even tried to draw it on paper. Okay, it's not as perfect as it could be, but I was only 15, and as no one taught me, I learned all by myself. The monsters on this one are not that bad, too. Here's the booklet from which I copied them. I had trouble running those games though, and that added even more to the pleasure I finally had playing them, when I finally had the hardware. Ultima required a lot of memory, that is, a full 640k, and I first had to play the game in CGA color mode until I found out how to edit the config sys file to allow a few more kilobytes to become available. When it could launch in EGA 16 colors, I was amazed. I remember playing it for a long time like this, until I realized I could also try to reach the heavenly, awesome VGA 256 color mode, which made me cry when it finally launched. It was unbelievable. Loom was another surprise find. I had read about it in magazines, and reviews were quite good. The game itself ran without issues in its fabulous EGA 16 colors, with absolutely amazing dithering effects. No need to crave for 256 colors when you do a wonderful job with 16. The other two boxes I kept all along were these. Ultima Underworld and Dungeon Master. What could you say? These were just the best of the best. How could you ever throw away something like this? Sid Meier, Richard Garriott, Brian Moriarty, Ron Gilbert. These have become legendary names now. To think that back then we were in the golden age and right inside the legend. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you like this channel, you might also check out my other one, Age of Ink, dedicated to game books, board games, and all that has ink on paper. See you soon for another Retro Dream.